Well, good morning. Good morning. It's very good to be here uh, among all of you. My wife and I have worshipped with you several times before and have always found uh, a friendly, warm, uh, nice welcome, and it's a good feeling to be back here with you today. What I'd like to do uh, in my thoughts with you this morning is to draw some comparisons between the reading from 1 Kings and the reading from Luke's Gospel, because there are some parallels uh, in those two readings that I would like to talk with you about in terms of a, of a play with three acts, a play with three acts. And it's not just an ordinary play. It's a play that uh, would be like an action drama, an action thriller. Now, when we think of action thrillers, we think of things like Raiders of the Lost Ark, or some movie like that. Well, this is not exactly like that, but I think that it can be as exciting because the scriptures are very exciting uh, if you look at them in the proper way. Now, the first um, scene or the first act in this drama is uh, what I call the escape scene. And there are two people escaping somebody or something. In the reading from Kings, it's the prophet Elijah who, escaped, who is escaping the wrath of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who was actually the power behind the throne. Jezebel. That name has a ring to it, doesn't it? There's a pun there. Jezebel ring. All right. She, um, she was an interesting person. But when we think of her name, or we think of the uh, insult that might be hurled at somebody, you Jezebel, you, we don't think of somebody like Florence Nightingale or <laughs> Mother Teresa of Calcutta, nobody nice like that. Instead, what comes to our mind is images of infidelity, untruthfulness, uh, harlotry, and actually the phrase, a painted woman comes from one of the biblical descriptions of Queen Jezebel because on the day of her death, she is said to have made herself up in such a way that it was too much makeup. Or what, what do we say today? Too much bling? I can't remember. But anyway, she, uh, she, evoked all sor she evokes all sorts of bad imagery. And part of the reason for that was because of her religion. She was a princess of a foreign kingdom whose religion was a pagan religion worshiping a, a, a god called Baal, B-A-A-L. When she went to northern Israel to marry King Ahab, she brought with her all of the false religion of Baalism. One of the things that she was able to persuade her husband, King Ahab, to do after they were married was to tear down all of the altars to the God of Israel, to kill many of the prophets, and instead, in their place, to install a priesthood of the idol Baal, who offered sacrifices uh, at the temples of Baal. Um, this was something that the prophet uh, Elijah challenged uh, Jezebel about. And in the end, uh, Jezebel paid the price for her infidelity and her unfaithfulness. At some point, uh, part of her own court turned against her. They took her to the window, of, an upper window in the palace. They threw her out to her death on the ground, and they left her body in the courtyard of the royal palace to be eaten by wild dogs. Not a, not a really nice, pretty picture, is it? But the evilness of this woman explains the reason that the prophet Elijah was fleeing out into the desert and why he, thought, why he sought the safety of a cave where he thought he would not be discovered and he would be safe from death and destruction. So that is the escape part of the scene from the reading from Kings. Now, shift gears, fast forward to Luke chapter 8. There's an escape scene there, too. And the person who is escaping there is Jesus himself. What is he escaping from? He's escaping from the press of the crowds. 
that were getting larger and larger as his fame spread, particularly because of the miracles that he had performed, the healing miracles and the multiplication of food and all the rest. Many times in the scriptures, in the four gospels, it's recorded that Jesus sought a place of refuge, sought an escape from the press of the crowds. Sometimes, as when he was tempted by Satan, it was out in the wilderness that he sought his respite. Sometimes it was at the top of a mountain. Sometimes it was, as it was in today's reading, to get into a boat, to sail across the lake, and to go into a place where he thought no one would know him and he could be anonymous. The problem that he encountered in each and every case, though, was that his reputation had preceded him. The news of the good things that he had done had gone ahead of him, and there was no way at all that he could remain anonymous in that sort of situation. So, the moment that Jesus stepped off the boat after crossing the lake, the moment he stepped onto land, he was met by the Gerasene demoniac who wanted and needed to be healed. Now, scene two in our drama is the one that I call the confrontation. The confrontation between somebody or something and the power and the presence of God, on the other hand. In Elijah's case, it was a confrontation with the living God as he sought to hide out in the cave in the wilderness. Inside the cave, a voice calls him to come to the mouth of the cave, to the door of the cave, and that God would reveal himself there. So there's a strong wind that comes, but that's not God. Then there is a gigantic earthquake that comes, and that's not God. And then there's fire, but that's not God. And then in this translation, it says there was the sound of sheer silence. In the old King James Version that we probably all, most of us grew up with, it was a still small voice. Now we could hear a still small voice if it spoke, probably, but I'm not sure how you could hear the voice of silence. It would be like that old question, what does it sound like when one hand is clapping? How do you hear the sound of sheer silence? In any event, the silence was deafening. Elijah knew he was in the presence of God. He became fearful. He took his mantle or his robe and he wrapped it about his head, covering up his eyes so that he wouldn't be able to see God because in those days it was believed to see God meant instant death. So he covered up his head with his mantle and God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And the implication in that was, you shouldn't be here. You should be somewhere else. What are you doing here? Then Elijah goes into uh, what God deems to be kind of a lame excuse for what he's doing there. He says, well, they've torn down your temples. They've killed your priests. You've killed your prophets. And now they're after me too. And you can just you know, metaphorically see God going like this. And then he asks the question again, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah explains the situation again, and God just cuts him off at that point and says, I want you to go back to where you came from, to Damascus, and do what you need to be doing there. In the case of Jesus, the confrontation, again, was with the demons inside of Gerasene demoniac. The, the name of the demon actually was Legion, but that was a, a synonym for many demons. I looked up what a Roman legion was numbered, and it's between five and 6,000 men. So to, for a demon inside of this man to say, my name is Legion, is to say there are too many of us to count. There are too many of us to number. There's such a great host. So Jesus commands the demons to leave the man, but before they leave, they say, please, don't send us back to the abyss. Don't send us back to the hell from which we came. And it's then that a very interesting thing happens in this story. Jesus strikes a bargain. 
he makes a deal with the demons and says, I won't send you back to the abyss, but I am going to send you into that herd of pigs that are grazing on the hillside over there. They agree. They leave the possessed man. They go into the pigs. The pigs start running down the hill over a cliff into the lake where they drown. Now, as a lover of St. Francis of Assisi, I have a little bit of a problem, you know, at face value with that story, but I'm going to save my thoughts about that for another sermon because it's actually only a footnote, a tiny footnote, to uh, today's larger picture of what's going on in that healing and in this sermon. So the aftermath of, of that exorcism, if you will, that healing, was that the townspeople became afraid of Jesus like Elijah had become afraid of God in the cave. They talked with one another and they said, look what he did to our pigs. Look what he did to our source of income. Look what he did to this man. They, he, he healed him. But he could do this again to another herd of pigs. You can just hear them thinking. So they asked him to leave the territory which he agrees to do. He gets into the boat, but before he leaves, the most critical part of this confrontation happens between the presence and power of God and the man who had been healed. The man who had been healed says, I want to go with you. Let me go with you. Let me be with you wherever you're going to go. And you can hear him thinking, I want to be with him because in his presence, I will be safe. Jesus refuses and tells him instead, as God had told Elijah, to go back to his home, to go back to his town, and to tell all the people that he encountered the good things that God had done for him in his life. So that's scene two, the confrontation. Scene number three, the final scene, is what I call the takeaway. It's what we can learn from this narrative, what we can learn from these two stories that I've kind of woven together into this drama, what we can take away, what can be important for us to remember and use as we apply the Christian faith to our everyday life. For me, part of what both of these stories say is that somebody in each of the two stories, in the first story it was Elijah, in the second story it was the man who had been possessed by a demon, somebody wanted to be somewhere else than where they were. Somebody wanted to be somewhere where God might not be able to use them as well as they could if they were where he wanted them to be. So. Elijah and this man who were healed were where they were partly because of their own design. They had defined the boundaries of their comfort zone in such a way that they would live only within that narrow box and not beyond the edges of that box if they could do anything about it. And so part of what we have as our message today, our takeaway, is the need that I think all of us have constantly to be re-examining the, the comfort zone that we're in, the boxes that we create for ourselves, the parameters within which we feel most comfortable functioning. To push those boundaries out just a little bit, to take some risks for God in so doing, realizing that he will give us the grace and power when we do that to have this new experience beyond where we have normally felt comfortable. And the other thing that is related to this that I think is important is for us to be open enough to the Holy Spirit in our lives to accept the possibility, the possibility that the prophets of God today may not come to us in ways that we would think of as being standard or traditional. About 50 years ago, the poet-songwriter Paul Simon 
wrote a haunting ballad called The Sound of Silence. Some of you may remember that. It was inspired both by the assassination the year before of President John F. Kennedy and also by this passage that we read this morning from 1 Kings in which there is the mention of the sound of sheer silence, the still small voice. And what he said in one part of that poem, which was put to music, was, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and in tenement halls. So I'm just saying that we need to be open to um, non-traditional, non-standard input from the Holy Spirit of God as we think about the way that God would speak to us and move us in this life. Um, the story is told of a little boy who after the 1030 service one Sunday morning in an Episcopal church went out with his father and mother and as they were leaving they greeted the pastor who was standing at the door. The mother greeted the pastor, the father greeted the pastor, and then the little boy stuck out his hand and said, Pastor, it's good to have heard you today, uh, but here's something I want to tell you. When I grow up, I'm going to get a real good job. I'm going to make lots and lots and lots of money, and I'm going to give some of it to you. And the pastor smiled at the little boy and said, well, that's really nice of you to think of me in that way, but why would you want to give me all that money? And the little boy said, because my daddy here says, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> well, Trinity on the Hill is, I think, in an exciting time in its, in its life and in its history. You're in the process of uh, seeking out and and retaining the services of an interim for a while, and ultimately you'll be uh, calling a new priest to come and be with you. And my wish for you uh, in that process is that in the end, you will find a person who is a faithful pastor, a person who is a true friend of yours in Christ, and a person who will be richly blessed with skills of preaching. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.